tendinopathy is not really an inflammatory condition. It is called tendinitis in the past. because it's non-inflammatory, 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 non-inflammatory. How are you, how are you gonna overcome overcoming gravity? What's up guys, welcome to the new Music is Conditioning episode four. On this episode, we'll be featuring the one and only Stephen Lowe, now, if you don't know who Stephen Lowe is, Stephen Lowe is the author of Overcoming Gravity as well as the author of Overcoming Poor Posture. Now, beyond guiding you uh, through how to progress into these advanced calisthenic moves, Stephen also places an emphasis with regards to injury prevention and also speaks about muscle imbalances in his book. If you're new to fitness or just new to working out in general, I think this is a pretty great book with regards to just showing you all of the basic terminology that you need and giving you a sense of programming. Uh, I definitely think a lot of what you find in the book, you can definitely incorporate and add into different modalities of training. Now, beyond being an author, uh, Steven is also a former gymnast, a coach. He has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry as well as a doctorate in physical therapy. He has also performed with Gymkhana, a gymnastics exhibitional troupe. If you don't know who they are, well, Check them out. Yeah, it's some pretty crazy and awesome stuff. Now with regards to Steve's own personal training, he primarily focuses on gymnastics, parkour, rock climbing, and sprinting. So uh, just a little bit of a side note, uh, it was a little bit difficult to kind of get the intro of this edit down. So we're just gonna dive directly into the interview. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoy. You mentioned something with regards to like not overdoing it. So I know a lot of people that are gonna get your book, just like how I got your book, are gonna wanna do everything. Um, mm -hmm. Especially, you know, you open up this thing and it kind of gives you a progression, a way to kind of get into all these moves that are pretty cool. How important would you say it's for you to, to just tell people to be patient and to be more specific orientated? Uh, very important. I, I think goals are a big part of that. Um, and like the way I like to think of goals is the common uh, SMART criteria where it's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time oriented. Um, so if you define those goals in that context, um, usually you can break them down into very short-term goals where you're working on specific things in, you know, like the, your next workout or two um, and working on the progression there. And then all those small progressions will add up into like a medium-term goal where that um, occurs in like about six, six to eight-ish weeks or so. Um, and then all those medium-term goals add up into those long-term goals. Uh, such as like a year down the line or two years or three years. Um, so just just seeing those progressions from the small progressions uh, build into like the moderate progressions, which build into the large, large progressions um, is, is important. You know, it kind of reminds me of music. There's a big emphasis sometimes on achieving things, but maybe not so much the journey. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe we can get into like this idea of the importance of being consistent and thinking more about being process oriented than thinking about trying to develop this perfect routine. So I guess I would ask you like, how important is consistency over perfection? That's a kind of a complicated question as well because you also want to take into account um, your overall ability level. Um, and uh, what, I, what I mean by that is um, if you're getting into uh, body weight fitness, or gymnastics spring training and you want to get like some of the more advanced moves uh, such as the planche or front lever 
or even in music, you want to get into those like very complicated classical pieces. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to do like too much of that too soon, like it's more than your fundamentals can handle, you're not going to be very successful. Um, so that's that's where you kind of want to pull it back and say and try to think of your training in terms of I guess ability level. So like you know, beginner, intermediate, advanced. I'm generally in like the beginner stage where um, my book tends to classify beginners uh, on a uh, level one to sixteen ish scale. Although I can go higher than that. Um, my my book tends to classify beginners in maybe the one level one to five range, whereas um, some of the more advanced isometric movements are in the like level seven, eight, nine, ten range. Um, working on the fundamentals such as like the, your push-ups, your dips, your pull-ups, and your rows, um, just to get like the um, basic strength in very common movement patterns is important. And then you know as you get to that level five-ish range, then transition that basic strength into the isometrics. Um, because if you go to the isometrics too fast, okay, you're working something hard, but um, it can easily, more easily use, um, lead to overuse injuries because your body is not necessarily prepared for that. And um, your progress might be slower because your just overall capacity to handle a harder exercise is not there yet. Um, so that, that is similar to movement or music in terms of, you know, if, if you don't know your scales that well, if you don't know, you know your music theory, if you don't have that dexterity down, then you're not going to be able to, you know, work on those harder pieces right away. You need to focus on the fundamentals first. I was wondering, do you find when you see people and their programming that that happens a lot? Like maybe somebody's working on planche progression and you're looking at either program and you're just like, this is great, but you, like you're just focusing on the planche. You're not focusing on some of the other things that are going to be healthy with regards to either not being injury prone um but also just being balanced yeah that, that's definitely fairly common i wouldn't say it's like everybody i, I have a couple sections of the book that kind of explain that concept where you know I, I like to start out with more dynamic movements rather than jump them straight to isometrics uh but you know there are, are always those people who just want to like jump straight to it and they probably make up you know 20 20 30 percent of the population and you kind of gotta like talk about them uh lot logically why that's probably not a good idea and they're actually going to make worse progress than if they had just you know stuck with the fundamentals for a bit yeah you, you got to build a house with something um, exactly yeah so the last time we spoke there was this idea that posture doesn't necessarily have to be seen as a template that there are, are a variety of postures but i was wondering like what are your opinions or suggestions about people that might have protracting shoulders uh, or a lot of thoracic flexion. Because that's super common in music. Maybe you're a cellist or a double bass player playing in the high register. Um, but a lot of people, even trumpet players, for example, you're finding yourself in these sort of shoulder protracted thoracic flexion in here and you're there for hours. So I guess, like, what are your opinions on solving those sort of muscle imbalances? Uh, yeah, so to recap a bit, um, what we went over is like there's no such thing as one correct posture um, just because everyone's a, bit, a little bit different in their individual limb lengths um, and what their various activities require. Um, someone who ha plays in an overhead sport like a um, baseball pitcher will have naturally more external rotation in their uh, shoulder than other people and then it might not even be balanced because their opposite arm may just have like normal human uh, external rotation. Um, so um, ba basically I think it's better to think about it in terms of um, being able to move well in and out of various postures because um, a lot of people think that you need to be in a particular posture such as like shoulders back straight or shoulders back chest up kind of like um, not cream forward in the neck, and that, that's all well and good, but if, you know, you, you feel very stiff um, just even moving into that position, it's not going to be something that is very sustainable in the long run. Um, so um, music uh, is very similar to, like, students and desk job people in that, you know, you may get, have that very head forward posture, your shoulders may be rounded, um, and that tends to lead to people getting stiff 
and weak in certain positions. Um, not necessarily, um, what, let's put it this way, like long muscles aren't necessarily weak and like short muscles aren't necessarily strong at all. Uh, so that's kind of a misconception there. But um, this, the, like the stiffness, the poor ability to move, um, the weakness are definitely true in some cases. And uh, to work on correcting that, um, thoracic mobility is always a good idea. Uh, working on rotation um, and extension to be comfortable with that, but also flexion because flexion can, um, the available range can also affect the rotation and extension a bit, um, especially in contact with the ribs. Um, and then also working on rowing, mo rowing motions to build up that back strength. Um, so when you're in that, you know, protracted shoulder support position, you know, you have that strength and also endurance to maintain that without getting super stiff. And then also usually rotate external rotation of the shoulder and um, neck flexion strength is usually some of the good things to work on. So it's almost like an emphasis on it's more important to just be relaxed in sort of the positions that they're in versus, I guess, moving yeah. into certain positions, but you always have the stiffness all the time. You can't really kind of flow through the things that you need to do. Uh, yeah, in, in some measure, because um, a lot of the most relaxed positions, for example, is like, um, so like, you know, have, standing up straight in general will use your the postural muscles of your core um, to activate. But if you just like lean and hunch over, um, you're actually not using a lot of muscles, uh, a lot of musculature, because a lot of that is taken up by your spine. Your spine can hold some of that weight. And that's where you can kind of run into some issues as well. So um, you, you want to minimize the muscle output, but also consider it in context of you don't also want to load up other structures that aren't necessarily um, capable of handling that particular stress. Like you hunch forward, okay, you're flexing your spine and you're push, putting it, um, a lot of posterior force on your back disc, which may not be that good for that in the long run. So. Um, think even in terms of um, just being comfortable with the movement in and out of certain postures and then also minimizing that muscle movement uh, or minimizing the, the muscle action such as like your core, but then also not uh, applying force to other structures like rounding your back uh, is also important to consider. Do you have any sort of general recommendations with regards to strength slash skills training, like with regards to frequency? Yeah, so most skills can be practiced very, very frequently. Um, and what I mean by skill training is generally that the skill is not limited by primary attributes like strength, endurance. So um, stuff like a handstand, for example, is mostly skill if you have the requisite strength and endurance to hold yourself upside down without getting very fatigued. So in the beginning, handstand could be um, a strength or endurance exercise, but as you get more proficient with that, um, it turns into a um, more skill-oriented exercise because you're learning how to balance. Um, the same thing is true with like children. You know, initially they can't hold themselves up like squat uh, or crawl because they're too weak. But once they get the muscles, then you see them learning how to crawl, and that's all skill practice. In terms of strength and endurance. Um, generally, more frequency is better, but then you also have to balance that with the overall volume. So, like, if you're going from, you know, you're working out an hour or two a day, and then you try to add another day um, of an hour or two, that's a pretty big jump in volume. So, like, if you're doing three times a week, you go to four times a week, adding that extra day is a 33% increase in volume, which can is above that 1.2 to 1.3 ratio uh, yeah. work to rest ratio ish that we talked about before, so that can definitely lead to a higher propensity of obese injuries there. So um, generally what I like doing is kind of spreading out the volume first. So if you're doing, say, 10 sets of total exercises and you're doing about three in each workout approximately, um, instead of going to like 12, total, or 12, 13 total exercises with another workout, um, just keep that same uh, volume of 10 sets and then spread it out through the four days instead of going immediately to um, a big big jump in volume. And then 
Um, as you feel good, you know, for a couple of weeks, then you can add in the extra set or two to make sure that the exercises go up from like one to two sets to three sets for all of them. The only thing maybe we'll finish off with is um, this idea of individuality and discovery. I was kind of wondering, um, obviously you have outlined ways to achieve uh, these skills uh, throughout your book. So how important is it for you to also let people know that there are so many different ways to achieve these skills? So um, I, I play a bit of keyboard and guitar and um, I found what works best for me in that context is not, I can't grind out hours and hours of practice. Um, I do better if I practice, you know, a, a song or something five to 10 times, take a couple hours break and then come back to it. So definitely figuring out your particular learning style and, you know, where you're limited in that because you want to, you know, practice up to where you are able to get the best practice. And then once it starts degrading, okay, that might not be the best time to continue trying to push um, your learning ability there. Um, so that's definitely important. And then also transitioning into finding your weaknesses, uh, which is a big thing, especially uh, in a sport like climbing. So um, in climbing, uh, a lot of it is learning technique, but then you're also limited by your physical capacity, such as your finger strength, um, your body strength, possibly your core strength, um, and your leg strength, and also um, like your fear of climbing climbing higher. You're not able to execute 100% of your abilities because your mental game is a little bit off. Um, so uh, to translate that, that's music a bit. You know, you mean need to find your weaknesses, whether it's, um, you know, practicing in a different key, uh, whether your, your fundamentals, your, your scales are kind of weak, or maybe you have a limitation in your endurance or other physical capacity. So um, working on finding those weaknesses is always a very good idea. You know, Steve, I think the only thing that I wanted to maybe ask that I don't think I did was the idea of the importance of knowing when to stop. I guess the idea of like talking about fatigue, like you mentioned it just a little bit now to just realize that sometimes stopping is progress versus to continue going. Do you see that a lot in terms of the stuff that you do and the people that you work with? Yeah, in exercise, that's more common uh, just because like exercise is very physically fatiguing for the most part. Um, so you usually get people who aren't either resting enough between sets. So it takes about three-ish minutes to fully refill the ATP in the muscles to, you know, have a, you know, 100% go at the next set. So usually you find people not resting up there, which leads to progressively decreased capacity in sets. Uh, so for example, if somebody could do 10 pull-ups, if they tried to max out first set with 10, um, their next set uh, with little rest might be 10, eight, six, seven, six or seven, um, and even possibly five if there's not enough rest. Um, so getting a, getting enough rest is important. And then also um, not necessarily like maxing out every session. So like if you did, um, if, you, if you did those 10 pull-ups in the first one, okay, maybe you have the eight and then maybe that six. So your average is like around an eight. Um, eight total reps or 24 total reps, uh, the 10, eight, and six. Um, whereas if you had stayed about one rep short of failure for three sets, you may have been able to do nine, nine, and nine, which is 27 total reps. So um, your overall practice is better with um, not necessarily going to the max and then taking enough rest between sets. And so that, that can kind of relate to music in that, you know, you don't necessarily want to be maxing out uh, your capacity every time as you'll still get very good adaptions but and and you're not also getting into that fatigue zone where it's negatively affecting your other practice um, and then also rest in terms of you know like between workouts that's where your body is learning growing and adapting um, to and increasing your physical capacity um, and so you definitely need to plan enough rest uh, you know Sleep is an obvious one. Good nutrition can help as well. Um, and decreasing your stress in other places so that um, you're being able to recover effectively and not hindering uh, that, that training process. Yeah, I can almost relate that to, I guess, like doing run-throughs of things to kind of maybe limiting the run-throughs 
of what you're going to do and kind of saying, okay, well, I know that uh, I want to run through this today and I'm going to give it kind of 100% and kind of just doing that once, analyzing it, looking at what happened and then kind of saying, okay, that's it for today. I gave it 110% versus like, okay, great. Uh, I analyze it and now I'm going to do it again and now I'm going to do it again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is, there is the concept in like sports of film study uh, versus, you know, actually practicing. Yeah. Um, and so if you're, you know, one of the best ways to learn is reviewing uh, your previous uh, practices or game or recitals or games and figure out what specific mistakes you're making in certain places and then having that in mind when you're practicing to correct those specific mistakes. And that can generally be more effective practice in the long run than just, you know, running through it over and over uh, without any knowledge of why you're making some mistakes here and there or uh, things like that. Yeah, I think, like, that's super important with regards to even just defining, like, what is practice. Like, practice or training isn't necessarily to be at the gym or to be in a practice room repeating things over and over. There are different sort of things that you can do some that are more physically taxing, some that aren't, but overall progression is like the main thing, right? So definitely tape, listening to recordings, that can be, it's like you said, answering the why and how things are happening versus just kind of uh, repeating again and again. Exactly. Um, Steve, I don't know if you have maybe any last bits of comments or or anything that you kind of want to reach out, um, maybe with regards to, I don't know, your musical experiences or with regards to maybe the best piece of advice you could give from your background, from your training, and from your experiences? One of the main things I just say is consistency really does trump all in the long run. Like, if you, like, the person who stays consistent with exercise, even though they may have, like, an inferior routine or maybe inferior practice in the case of music, the person who stays consistent over the long run is usually going to improve the most and um, get to the highest level of ability. Obviously, like at the elite elite, um, you got everyone who's like practicing super hard, and you know they also have those those musical gifts and talents. But um, for for most of us average people, uh, consistency is probably the most important thing to remember when doing things. So you know something is better than nothing. Uh, be disciplined about getting getting your practice in, um, working on the things that you want to improve at, uh, because you're not going to hit those goals without actually doing something about them.